Uh, give you a brief introduction. My name is Chad Hart. I'm an associate professor of economics here at Iowa State University, and it's a lovely 80 degrees here today in Ames. And I only wish the corn looked as good as it does in the picture I've got in front of you on the on the PowerPoint there. It has been a struggle this year uh, to produce corn, and that's why we're going to talk about crop insurance today. And I'll give you a brief background on how the crop insurance program works how farmers participate in it, and what sort of coverage we see out there for our farmers, especially as I look at what we're trying to cover in the U2U project. Again, you know, looking at our uh, area that we're in, we're looking at you know, climate change implications for corn producers, and crop insurance is one of the risk management tools that producers currently have that, if you will, has some built-in mechanisms to update as climate change or climate conditions affect crop yields and production. And so I want to start off by talking about crop insurance. It's just one of many risk management tools that producers have, but arguably it's the most important federally subsidized tool that they have right now. In fact, as we look at the farm bill debate that's going on, both Republicans and Democrats seem to be in agreement that crop insurance will be the backbone of the federal risk management strategy for agriculture for crops. Now crop insurance has been around a very long time. Uh, it was set up originally in the 1930s. Um, it was a very small program until basically the drought of 1988 and that's when we really saw an upkick in participation in crop insurance and an interest on the part of the government side to make crop insurance a much larger program within the federal support structure. Traditionally, the crop insurance program was set up to protect farmers in times of low crop yields, such as this year. But now we've evolved this sort of coverage to offer protection against low prices as well. In fact, some of the data I'm going to show you shows how farmers have basically moved from just ensuring their crop yields into ensuring crop revenue. So they're looking to protect the bottom line as far as their finances are concerned on the farm. Crop insurance is a very large program. It's available for over 100 commodities throughout the country. Anything from corn to macadamia nuts can be insured in the federal crop insurance program. And it's built, whether you're a large or a small producer, it is scalable to the size of the farm out there. So a farmer has a great deal of opportunities to participate in crop insurance and can tailor that participation to match the size and scope of their farm. It's going to cover most if not all the commodities that are produced on the farm, at least on the crop side of the equation. Now, why is the federal government involved? Well, when we look at how crops traditionally fail, and this is data going back into the 1940s, what we find is that drought, like this year, is the dominant uh, cause of loss in crop insurance. And that means that it, crop insurance is a little different than like, you know, in this case looking at car insurance or home insurance. Uh, for example, if I'm driving a car and I have a wreck, that doesn't mean my neighbor has a wreck. But if I'm experiencing a drought as a farmer, it's quite likely that my neighbor is also experiencing that drought. And so the correlated risk of losses here, the idea is that an individual in driving car insurance, an individual loss is not necessarily tied to a big group loss in the area that I'm in. Whereas with crop insurance, it typically is. Droughts, floods tend to scale across farmers. And that means that the scale of losses within a disaster year tends to be much greater under crops than under other types of things that we insure against. Since you have these potentials for large losses, that means you need a insurance company that can handle the wide swings in payments that are required under crop insurance. And what happened in the early 1930s is some private companies tried to do crop insurance, got hit by the 1930s Dust Bowl, and those companies are no longer here. They went bankrupt. One of the few entities that has pockets large enough to handle the types of losses we see in agriculture is the federal government. They got involved in crop insurance back in the 30s, and they remain, if you will, the backbone on which the system depends upon because in times of drought or in times of flood, 
basically it's only the federal government that will have the ready pool of funds available in order to meet those crop losses and make those payments. At the same time though, this system is built upon a number of companies. Private companies are involved in delivering crop insurance and so it's a public-private partnership here. The private companies service and sell the crop insurance. The federal government serves as the backbone to make sure that all producers will get paid in times of loss. Now when you look at the crop insurance decision for a producer, the first decision that a producer has to make is what type of insurance to buy. As I mentioned, originally the program was set up to cover individual yields at the farm or field level. That was predominantly what they did from the 1930s up until about 1995. And it's still available today. A, a producer can bring in his yields. Typically we're looking at a 10-year history of yields. We use the average of that 10 years to determine how much yield we will insure in a product. But since the 1990s, we've seen development of other crop insurance products. Another one's called Area Yield, and you notice I've got these acronyms out there. GRP, which means Group Risk Plan. And the essence of this one is instead of insuring the yield directly on my farm, one of the things I can do is I can just ensure what the county level yield is. Thinking that if my farm yield moves with the county yield, that type of insurance has some meaning to me in terms of risk management. And that type of insurance, since it's tied to the county yield, actually costs a little bit less because there's less, if you will, yield risk or yield variation in county yields than there are in farm yields. And so the federal government offers that as a possible way to insure crops. Most popular right now, started in 1996, is the individual revenue policies. And here the acronyms RP stands for risk, Revenue Protection, and RPE is Revenue Protection with the Harvest Price Exclusion. They drop that stuff and just call it RPE. And the idea of that is that instead of just insuring yields, we're also insuring prices. And I'm going to walk you through how they do that. That is now the most popular type of insurance we have out there. And that's often what we're seeing as we look at how the federal government is approaching agricultural support. We've been moving away from just price and just yield to a revenue, a combined price times yield type of coverage. And then finally you see they've been combining these different types. There's an area yield individual revenue combination known as GRIP uh, for Group Risk Income Protection Plan. And it basically combines the county level yields with the individual revenue protection. So producers have a lot of choices here in the types of insurance they can obtain. I'm going to walk you through some examples here and it's easiest to give us a, a very simple example farm. And let's say that I'm a farmer here in Story County, Iowa where Ames is located. I've got a hundred acres going to do corn this year. And as I mentioned here, we look at historical yields to determine how much insurance I can purchase. Let's say that my five-year average yield, and that's the five years I've got data on, is 180 bushels per acre. So I'm looking that I can hopefully insure something off that 180 bushels per acre. First choices again I make are the type of policy and also the coverage level that I want. Think of this like the deductible you choose on your car. I can choose a deductible here between anywhere between 50 to almost 90% of my either expected yield or expected revenue. And again, that's the farmer's choice. They get to pick what level of coverage that they're looking for. In most cases, the 75% coverage level is the most popular, and that's the one I'm going to work through here today. Another factor that influences my choice in crop insurance is what price level is going to be built into my insurance. And this is where the federal government has done some harmonization over the last few years and they've now determined that what they're going to look at there is the February average price on the December corn futures price. And so we're going to spend a lot of time talking about futures markets. In this case, this is the Chicago Mercantile Exchange or Chicago Board of Trade price that you see out there. And it's specifically trying to look at what's the planting time price for corn, but I want to look at what that planting time says about harvest prices when I go out into the field and harvest that crop. 
And for this year in 2012, what that average price in February was, is it said that the corn in December, when I go to deliver that, will be worth $5.68 a bushel. Federal government uses that futures price to set as the insurance price that I can get here. And so in my case, I'm looking at 75% of 180 bushels per acre. And if I do yield insurance, that will be my guarantee. If I want to take that times 568, that would represent the expected revenue I could possibly insure. And it's up to me of which one of those I want to choose. Now, under, again, under the individual yield insurance, this is known as YP or yield protection. Again, I get to pick that percentage of yield to insure. In this case, I said 75. The price that we're going to use is that 568, and that price is set. As soon as I make that choice, in this case, I have to make that choice in February or March before March 15th. Then the price that's established there is set up front. It does not change no matter how prices move throughout the rest of the year. So if I pick individual yield insurance, the 568 is determined up front. I know that in March. And when it comes time to settle this in November or December, I know that 568 is the price that will be used to value a bushel of corn. Now let's say I've got a yield of about 100 bushels per acre. So sort of like this year, we're seeing, you know, I could see a substantial drop in my yield well below that 180 bushel average that I've got. So I've got a yield loss. I've taken a hit here. Because as you look, you know, my guarantee is 75% times 180 bushels per acre. I'm sort of showing that as I bounce the green arrows around here. Basically, that sets my guarantee. Off the top of my head, I guess I should have worked the numbers out here. 180, bear with me, times 75. So my guarantee is 135 bushels per acre. So I'm 35 bushels short of what I insured. Well, the federal government's going to pay me for those lost bushels. How much are they going to pay me? $5.68 a bushel. So in this case, given where my yields ended up, given the price of 568 up front, the farmer will receive an indemnity or an insurance payment of $198.80 per bushel. Again, this is meant as a risk protection feature to help producers deal with low, in this case, yields due to natural disasters. One of the key things to remember with crop insurance, it does require natural disasters, if you will, to be insurable. Acts of God are insured, acts of man are not. And so if I got this 100 bushels per acre because there was a fire in my field due to a combine incident, that's not insurable. But if there's a fire in my field due to a lightning strike, then it is. And so this is, again, related to a natural disaster that I get this sort of coverage. And basically what it does in the terms of yield insurance is any time my yield is below this green line here, in my case 135 bushels per acre, I'll receive a payment that basically brings me back up to as if I had gotten 135 bushels per acre at a price of $5.68, that predetermined price. If I have any yield above 135, I will not receive a payment and the idea of this payment is not influenced by where prices go. For example, in the case of this year, the price started out at 568, so we were up here, but now we're talking about $8 corn prices off the chart. The idea is that yield insurance does not react to that price change. Once the corn is priced in the planting season, it remains priced at that level as we look at it at harvest time. Like I say, this was the standard insurance policy that we saw out there up until the mid-1990s. Then revenue insurance sort of took over. And one of the things that influenced that is that the yield insurance, again, didn't react to price levels. And so it's only reacting when you're looking at lower yields. And this is a graph just showing you as yields decline, moving from this, you know, my guarantee's at 135, that's when the payments start. The payments continue to ratchet up for each lost bushel. And so I could be looking at payments this year for some of my farmers here in Iowa. They'll have yields around you know, 90, 80 bushels per acre. They could be seeing some substantial payments coming through a crop insurance. 
However, in a good crop year, you know, when they're getting 180 bushels per acre, crop insurance will not pay out in those years. And the idea with how crop insurance is rated is that it's rent rated to be actuarially fair, which means that the average payout under crop insurance should be equal to the average premium being paid for crop insurance in that year. That The idea is it's a wash when you look at the cost versus the benefit of the program overall. Now, revenue insurance, like I say, it came in in the 1990s. It is the most popular type of insurance we've got out there, and it has the twist of it brings in price levels, and it will react to price levels as we move through the season. The farmer here gets to choose a percentage of expected revenue to insure. The percentages here are the same whether I choose for price or for revenue, or I'm sorry, for yield or for revenue. And this expected revenue is based up on that average yield, so we'll still use that 180 bushels per acre for my farm, times that initial crop price, that 568. So they start out with the same base. But the difference here is that with the revenue product, the price at harvest time, when we go to value the crop, reflects the current market conditions there. So the price is not set at the beginning. It can move around and it can influence the size of the payment that the producer receives. As I mentioned, there are two sort of types of revenue insurance. There's the revenue protection and this revenue protection with the harvest price exclusion. I'm going to walk you through those in a little more detail, but I'll tell you, most producers choose just the revenue protection plan. And uh, there are reasons why they do that. It's basically because they're able to capture higher prices in a market like we're seeing today where Prices have moved from that 568 up into the $8 range for corn. In our example, again, I'm using 75% coverage, have an average of 180 bushels per acre, and that price set up front was 568. So in my example here, this farmer has insured $766.80 worth of revenue per acre. As long as revenues fall below that level, they would receive a payment from crop insurance. Any revenues above, no payment there. But the wild card here is not only are yields moving around underneath this, prices will as well. So the final value of the crop depends upon those average futures prices over the harvest period. And in this case, the harvest, the prices used here are always tied to a specific futures contract. In the case of corn, it's always on the December corn contract. It's just we look at it at different times throughout the year. For the planting price, the 568, we're looking at it in February. For the harvest price, we're going to look at that same contract. What is it priced at in October? And that price difference between those months will help determine the insurance payment for the producer. Now let's say, again, that case that I had, my yields due to the drought got hit pretty hard. I'm at 100 bushels per acre. But let's say that I was the only one that got hit. Maybe it was a hailstorm that took me down to 100. Everybody else had a good crop, and we could have been staring at prices at around 450. In this case, the producer insured 75% of the crop, which was 180 bushels per acre, times 568, so that's my guarantee, which was $766. But we're going to look at what was it actually valued at. Well, I got a 100 bushel per acre corn crop, and the price is at 450 on that future price. And so when I do the math here, farmer's going to receive here $316.80 for that loss. So you can see in this case, given the price drop, that they, this producer saw with the yield drop, they're actually receiving a larger payment than if they had bought just yield insurance alone. The price, the revenue component here did matter. Now, let's say we've got another example here looking at this. This is the payout here. And so if they had bought the harvest price exclusion, what that means is I don't build this high, the higher, the possibly higher harvest price into the guarantee. I get what looks like a normal revenue curve here. As prices go up and yields go down, this is the line that draws out $766 per acre, the combination of prices and yields that do that. 
Anytime I'm to the lower left of that line, I'm going to receive an insurance payment. That insurance payment is going to bring me back up to the line. So it's basically recovering me back to that coverage level. If I'm anywhere above the, uh, to the upper right of the line, no payment is received. However, most producers like to capture that harvest price when it goes higher. Because what they're looking at here is the potential for much higher payments here. Revenue insurance, you know, this graph looks like the yield insurance, but you'll notice over here I'm talking about revenues down on the bottom uh, scale here. The idea is I'm covering revenue, and so I can have a loss created by low yields or by low prices or the combination. And so the potentials for payment, if you will, are much greater under revenue insurance. And that's why a lot of producers like to look at it. However, they do like the idea of capturing those higher harvest prices. And so the RP, the revenue protection policies, have what's called a harvest price option, which says if the harvest price is greater than the planting price, then we're going to use the harvest price everywhere. And what this ends up doing is saying, okay, if the harvest price goes up, we're going to give you a higher guarantee on your insurance. We're going to give you more protection than you started out with because the market has moved to create a higher value for your crop. And I like to tell my students this is like giving them a put option. It's, it's, it's giving them a financial benefit because you're automatically guaranteeing them the planting price, but you're also guaranteeing them the opportunity if prices go higher that will reflect that in the insurance payment. And like I say, a lot of producers like that because any year like this year, like I say, the price started out here at the 568 range and what they have experienced is the price has dramatically moved up, which means the amount of revenue they've been able to protect under the insurance is much greater as well. And so that is a key risk management tool, if you will, for producers. A lot of producers who forward contract their crop are worried if they're going to come up short on this contract. Because if you come up short on a forward contract, you have to buy those bushels back. And you have to buy them back at whatever the market price is bearing at that time. Well, right now that price is about $8. And so if I was only getting five sixty-eight per bushel on each bushel that I lost, but having to pay $8, I'm losing a fair amount of money. However, if I can get my insurance where my guarantee moves up and it's paying me $8 and I have to turn around to pay $8 to buy out of my contract, then it's a wash. And so this is revenue insurance policies are built for producers who market with forward contracts and so they have that financial support and guarantee that helps them be comfortable with forward contracting. Under the insurance, let's say that we have a year like this year. And so, you know, again, 100 bushels per acre, the drought hit me, but prices have moved up to $8. This is going to change the payment that this producer will receive because we're going to replace this 568 price under the revenue protection policy. In fact, we're going to move it forward and instead of 568 there, we're going to plug in $8 because again, under the revenue, revenue protection plan, they use the higher of the two between the planting price and the harvest price. In this case, harvest price $8. That's what gets figured in here. And so what would have been, let me go back here, if you compute this at 568, you would get a negative value so there would be no payment under the insurance. At the $8 price, suddenly there is a payment, and that payment is $280 per acre. So this helps producers, again, capture some risk management benefits, allows them to be more comfortable in forward contracting, and gives them the security to know that their insurance protects them against price moves which may be harmful to them. And a lot of producers have chosen to do that. What, in essence, revenue protection does is it combines the best of the other two policies, the revenue protection with the exclusion and the yield insurance. Here's a graph comparing those for my example farm here. And you can see there are areas where both these policies pay. 
There are areas where just the yield insurance would pay. There are areas where just the straight revenue insurance without the harvest price exclusion would pay. But when I use RP, when I take that exclusion out, what it does is it gives me the best of both worlds. It pays in all those cases where one or the other product would have paid. As such, you would expect that this would cost a little more to producers, which it does, because it's giving them the best protection on both ends. You get yield protection when prices go high. You get revenue protection when basically prices go low, and it combines that for the farmer. In this case, we've seen a lot of producers pick up on that. How often does it kick in where we need to look at that harvest price having an impact here? Well, over the past 12 years, it's happened four times, so about a third of the time. And 2012 looks like it's going to be another one, so we'll be five out of 13 here. So producers have seen a benefit uh, from having the ability to factor in harvest prices into their insurance. For soybeans, it's been even greater. It's been six out of 12. So you can see this works for both corn, soybeans. It's available for wheat, for cotton. It's available for many commodities across the country. Farmers have another decision as well. When you're looking at insurance, it's not as simple as I'm insuring my car. When I'm looking to insure my crops, the government allows me to, if you will, split my farm up into different what they call insurance units. The most easiest one to think about is what they call a whole farm unit. Uh, so I'll start here at the bottom, and this is where I'm going to combine all the crops in the county. I'm going to add that revenue together, and we're going to insure that revenue for the entire farm. That's something that is, is, makes it fairly simple to, to conceptualize here, but at the same time, it's putting all the risk into one basket. And a lot of producers actually do not like that sort of coverage. They would like more individualized coverage by either crop or by, especially by field. And so we see these other types of units. The enterprise unit basically combines all the acreage of one crop in the same county. So I can insure my corn separately from my soybeans or from my wheat. A lot of producers choose to do that as far as their protection. So they can look at their corn insurance separate from their soybean insurance and go on down the line. Basic units combine owned and rented acreage, but the idea is that they'll separate depending upon who owns it. And so in this case, it's, if you will, getting more towards field level type insurance and optional units is just even greater breakdown. So it's possible for a farmer, if I'm farming in 10 sections in a county, I could have 10 separate insurance units and each unit will be evaluated individually to see if it receives a crop insurance payment or not. But if I'm in an enterprise unit situation, then all 10 of those units are added together and I only have one insurance policy to worry about. So farmers, again, have a lot of choices that they can make as far as tuning crop insurance to their individual situation. A factor that influences that choice is the amount of subsidy that they receive. Crop insurance, since the federal government is involved, is a subsidized product. And in fact, the subsidy depends upon the type of unit that the farmer chooses and the coverage level that they've chosen. For example, in our case, we've been talking about 75% coverage. Well, if I choose 75% coverage and I have either basic or optional units, so I'm insuring at the field level, then the government's going to pick up about 55% of the premium bill, and I, the farmer, am going to pay 45%. If I move to an enterprise unit where I'm adding all my corn acres together in the county, then the government's going to pick up 77% of the premium bill, and I'm going to pick up the 23%. If I go to whole farm unit, a little bit more subsidy there. Why is the government changing the subsidy structure here to sort of, if you will, push you towards that enterprise and whole farm unit? Because it costs them less to adjust the insurance to make the payments on the insurance. Because think of it as a, an issue with aggregation. The more I add together, if you will, the the, the deviations around the mean get tighter and tighter, so there's less risks to the federal government if we can get them to add their insurance units together, and they've set up the subsidy structure to do just that. 
You'll also notice though that these subsidies do change dramatically as we change coverage level. In this case, you know, if I buy 65% coverage, government's picking up roughly two thirds of the bill as I move up to 85% of the coverage, then the farmer's picking up nearly two thirds of the bill. So they do drop the percentage subsidy as we move up through the coverage levels, but on a dollar per acre basis in most cases, the farmer is getting the biggest subsidy dollar per acre as they move to higher levels of coverage. And these premium subsidies are available across all the programs. So whether I'm looking at corn or macadamia nuts, these subsidy rates are the same for both those in terms of percentages. Now to give you an example of how much a producer might pay for the insurance, these are actual insurance premiums for the year for 2012 here for my example farm in Story County, Iowa. And as you can see here, my farmer, he could have bought anything from 50 to 85% coverage. 90% coverage is only available if I go to those group or that area plan when I'm insuring at the county. And then here's YP for the straight yield insurance, RPE, which is I call it the straight revenue insurance, and then this RP, which includes that harvest price kicker on the end. And you can see here that there are some cases where the revenue coverage can be cheaper than just the yield coverage alone. And that's due to what we call the natural hedge. Typically, when you have low yields, you have high prices, like we're seeing with the drought today. Insurance. tends to favor revenue coverage. As you go up, with the harvest price exclusion, small cost to them as they go forward. And as you look across corn producers across most of the upper Midwest, breaking up, okay, how clear am I coming? Probably just me and I'm getting ready to wrap up though as well. As you look at for our farmers that we are approaching with the U2U project, uh, their crop insurance policy decision depends upon several factors. It depends upon the type of farm that they're in and the crop mix they are in. For example, as we look at North Dakota producers, they're often growing multiple crops and so things such as the whole farm coverage can make a lot of sense to them where a lot of my Iowa producers are basically sometimes one crop, usually two crops, and so they tend to stick with op or optional units to enterprise units, and they definitely tend to separate their corn and soybean insurance. Another thing is how well my county average yields move with my yields on the farm. If those tend to move together fairly well, then I'll probably look at those area policies because they do tend to be cheaper. Then finally, and probably the biggest one for, for me looking at this, is that the marketing decision that the farmers make should be tied to their insurance policies. The development of the revenue policies was based upon this idea that producers are using forward contracts, that one of the biggest concerns is that they would fall short on their production for that forward contract, and that they would need some insurance to help them deal with what would be likely higher prices to get out of that contract. And so revenue protection was built on the idea that the farmer would link their marketing decision with their crop insurance decision. And like I say, we have seen that. This was last year in Iowa. I could, can't show you this year because not all the data is in yet for 2012 as far as crop insurance coverage. But here for my Iowa corn producers, roughly 90% of all the corn in Iowa 
She is covered under crop insurance, and as you can see here, nearly 90% of that 90% is covered by revenue protection. So farmers have chosen to insure both prices and yields, and they want to capture those higher prices at harvest time when they can. And that's true whether I look at corn or soybeans, we see that. The same is true as I look across states, Minnesota, Illinois, Indiana, we see a very similar pattern there in how producers utilize crop insurance. And when we look at the levels of coverage that they tend to pick, again, they tend to go to higher levels of coverage. 80-85% has become the most popular insurance coverage over the past, especially five years. Um, and we see very few pick the lower levels of coverage. For example, here in Iowa, you're talking about less than 2% choose 50% coverage. Most of them, again, are at the very high levels. Those that are up here at 90%, those are the ones that choose to use that county level insurance. Then you can step up to 90%, but it's a very small percentage of producers that do that. All right, with that, you've let me rattle on here for nearly 40 minutes. Other than the audio issues that we have out there, do you have any questions, comments that we can talk about about crop insurance? I'm a little worried by the stunned silence. Nate asks, who do farmers get advice from? And in this case, with crop insurance, I would say they, they're getting it from a variety of sources. So there are crop insurance agents throughout the country who sell and service this product. So the farmers are talking to them. They're also talking to their agronomist and their seed salesman about what types of insurance. Oftentimes, your lender, your banker may have a crop insurance arm as well. And so they're talking to a variety of people in order to get information on crop insurance. Also, I know a lot of our extension folks, um, especially on the farm management side, we have crop insurance publications out there. I know Purdue has a good set, Illinois has a good set, Iowa State as well, Missouri. Um, looking at crop insurance programs, looking at decision tools to help producers choose that. Linda asked, uh, on the price chart, was that data pre or post subsidy? That is post subsidy. So in this case, the farmer was paying $20 per acre, and given the subsidy levels you're seeing out there, uh, the federal government was paying also around $20 to $30 per acre on that insurance. And this is Dennis. Shoot, Dennis. Um, I, know, I don't want you to go into this ton, but I think it's worth mentioning there is additional coverage that people can buy that is basically weather insurance now. And I don't know if you know how many people in Iowa are doing that. I've heard about it a couple times in South Dakota. Um, I'm not sure where to, what to give people advice on that, but there is specific weather insurance that you can buy uh, from a crop standpoint, too. Yep, certainly. De Dennis brings up the idea that there are different types of insurance. And I'll mention weather insurance is not the only specialized type you see out there. Private companies offer weather insurance, hail insurance, fire insurance. Those are all private products that can be sold. They tend to be built on top of the federal crop insurance. That, that means the federal government has nothing to do with them, but the, the private companies build off the coverage you've already got there. Uh, the weather insurance that, that Dennis mentions is a very new product, basically available this year. Um, some smart folks from Google decided to get into the crop insurance ball game and they started this company where you can insure specific weather events. And uh, in Iowa, we've seen limited pickup on this. I would say, you know, I know of about three producers that have done this. And, and the, the style of insurance that we're talking about there is I can insure, you know, I can go to these guys uh, from, and I forgot what they call, I think they call themselves the Climate Corporation. I can go to them and say, I would like to insure the average amount of rainfall on my farm through June and July. And they can look at the weather data and they will tell me, okay, let's say that the average is, is 10 inches over that two month period. I can buy insurance to cover. And if more than 10 inches falls, then I will not. Uh, 
product because I get to pick, you know, what is it I want to look at. Is stylized product that is brand new and, and something that's uh, that we could see out there. Well, typically we see farmers picking hay. A private product. That covers specific events. I also mentioned five. Insurance policies, you can be covered under that. Going back to Nate's question, who do farmers get advice from? Their crop insurance agent can lay out all these opportunities for other insurance products or risk management tools. Okay, guests ask, if crop insurance is designed to be actuarially sound, is there generally a net economic loss to the government during major drought events or is it a wash? This is a very good question and actually it's true that crop insurance, while it's meant to be actuarially sound to the producer, it is a net loss to the government because when I say actuarially sound, you know, as I said that the premiums paid in match the losses going out. What we haven't talked about is the overhead, the expenses to sale and service the product. The government picks up all of those costs. And so even in a wash year in terms of payouts versus premiums, the government is still losing the money servicing the product. And that's true whether there's a drought or not. So the federal government, like I say, this is their, as I see it, major support program that they offer to farmers, and it does cost year after year. Melissa says, you mentioned forward contracting. What other types of marketing strategies could influence your crop insurance purchases? Um, arguably, the forward contracting is probably the biggest one, but you will see if farmers are using futures hedges or doing some options positioning, especially pre-harvest time, they will link that up to their crop insurance decision. So when I'm looking at the crop insurance and marketing mix here, it's all in the pre-harvest marketing. If Once the crop is harvested, then crop insurance really doesn't have an impact on the marketing decision. Now these are all great questions. I recognize I've covered a lot of ground here and I've left a lot of big holes in it. I, I usually spend, when I talk with farmers, two to three hours talking about crop insurance decisions. So it, it, we can get into the weeds here fairly quickly. Chad, I, I, I'll, going back to the weather insurance, we've run into that a couple times here in South Dakota. And, and I would say they're using at least from a climatologist standpoint, maybe a little bit questionable uh, ways they estimate how much they rainfall they get in an area. I think they were using radar, and which sometimes here I have some questions about how much rain. So from a producer standpoint, I, I talked with one. I think he got he got jilted a little bit by by his insurance company from what I looked at it. Oh yeah, no, yeah, this brings up a good point. The, the idea of this weather insurance, that they definitely tie it to the data that, that they could find and so they are using uh, radar estimates or they're using averaging across weather stations to make it, if you will, localize it to the farm. And either of those approaches is an approximation. Um, as producers look at weather insurance, they have to recognize that. If you will, there's a, a weather basis risk here that the radar may be showing rain that did not actually fall on my farm, but the, you know, the radar estimate shows that it did. And so, going at a little more, yeah, you can feel a little jilted here. Melissa asked, how much does that weather insurance cost? It varies a great deal depending upon what I want to insure. Uh, for example, I talked about insuring two months worth of rainfall. Uh, that carries a very low premium to it. I know for the one producer I talked to here in Iowa that did it, he was looking at around $10 per acre. 
But I did ask him, I said, what if I want to ensure on a you know, specific date? So I want to ensure high temperatures, you know, uh, you know, 93 or above during the, the second week in July. So I'm worried about pollination of the corn. Uh, there they quoted me a, a price of around $25 per acre. So it really depends upon what you choose. And that's the deal with the weather insurance products, the private ones. There is a tremendous deal of flexibility in what you can choose, but there's also tremendous variability in how much that's going to cost you. Does it look, does looking uh, at U.S. Uh, crop indemnity payments from natural disasters qualify as a way to approximate the cost of a natural disaster? I'd argue yes. The idea is that those crop indemnities that we see paid out there, in the most case, are based upon natural disasters. What you might have to tease out is the price impact of that, uh, given the revenue products. Uh, but for example, in this case, what we're seeing here with the 2012 drought, uh, we will likely see crop insurance indemnities on the order of at least $25 billion worth of payments to producers this year. Um, it's definitely a large natural disaster, and these are, you know, economic payments for that. So it, it, it's a very good way to approximate the cost of a natural disaster. In fact, when we look at, you know, for example, the the cost of uh, Hurricane Katrina or, or Andrew, oftentimes the cost that's quoted there includes the insurance payments that flow because of that natural disaster. Nate asked, do crop insurance agents receive commission based upon the insurance product that they sell? In other words, is there an incentive to sell the Cadillac package? Yes, they do. Um, it varies by company that's involved here. Um, so you do see that influence, but at the same time, uh, a crop insurance agent needs to build a rapport with their clientele. So they work to sell them the insurance product that works best for that farm because I want to keep a long-term relationship with this producer. Um, and so what I've noticed um, agents doing, especially over the last few years, they haven't necessarily been trying to sell the Cadillac package. But they've been trying to push the coverage level high while reducing the, the premium and actually end up reducing their commission by telling producers to move to those enterprise units, which tends to cost a little less. Again, why are they doing that? They want to maintain this long-term relationship. I'm better off over five years making 16% commissions over five years as opposed to 20% in one year, and then you leave me because you found a better agent who's going to stylize the product more to your needs. Uh, Dennis says, uh, my explanation of crop insurance also shows why there are questions about outlooks at various times of year to guide them. Again, this crop insurance is based upon pricing and yield outlooks at planting season and at harvest time. So yeah, it does bring up questions as to how good those outlooks are. What are the risk of variability around those outlooks as we go through time? And so these, if you will, that risk is automatically built into this government support structure. Another reason why, again, crop insurance is federally supported. The federal government is one of the few entities that can take on this amount of risk. All right, I'm waiting on Melissa. She's typing. Has anybody else got a question over the phone? Did anybody see uh, uh, oh, Blue Show? One of the shows where they were talking about crop insurance with Babcock from Iowa State, and it was turned Obamacare for corn. <laughs> so Dennis asked about, yeah, it was the Colbert Report. Uh, Bruce Babcock, a colleague of mine, um, got in there and he, I mentioned the, the, the quote, the pull quote was, yeah, crop insurance is Obamacare for corn. Um, and in certain respects, you know, that was actually a very apropos statement. The idea is that crop insurance is available. It's, it's not mandatory, but the idea is most producers in this country do utilize it. It's government supported, so in that respect, it's like the health insurance package. And there's a lot of similarities there. Um, it is a very controversial product because of the way it is managed. 
this public-private partnership between private crop insurance companies and the federal government is a sticky situation. Uh, there are risks involved and returns, if you will, uh, that can flow here. We're talking about a, in a drought year where there's going to be payouts to producers. But one of the hardest questions to address is that when you have a good year and those farmers have paid in these premiums, but we don't pay out any indemnities, who gets to keep those premiums? And that has been a contentious debate within the U.S. Congress, how that is split between the private companies and the federal government. And Melissa brings up a question, do I see subsidies going down or being eliminated one day? As I mentioned, subsidies are a big part of this. Uh, they have been changing over time. If you look back at the subsidy structure in the 80s, it was actually less than what we see today. The government raised those subsidies up to entice producers to participate and now as we entered the budget debates of this year, they are talking about reducing those subsidies. It's possible that they could be eliminated one day, but it, it, it's going to be a tough political battle for that to occur. As I mentioned, Congress right now seems to say that crop insurance is one of the few things they're trying to hold a steady, if you will, budget in while they reduce other programs instead. Uh, but I think you will see some pressure to reduce the cost even in the crop insurance program. I think another point that's good to make, Chad, is that people who have crop insurance then are not eligible for other farm programs, right? Well, no. I mean, if you if you have crop insurance, you're eligible for other programs. But um, for, programs, I guess. yeah, for a while there, back in ninety five, uh, nineteen ninety five, Congress for one year made it where if you wanted to be in any other government programs, you had to buy crop insurance. They dropped that restriction immediately the next year because there was significant blowback from producers. And some of them were pointing out, hey, I grow a crop that, you know, there's very limited crop insurance coverage. Why should you force me to do that? And so they've talked about this at times. Another thing they've talked about is linking um, the conservation requirements on the farm to crop insurance. Uh, that is something that's been debated, but that hasn't occurred as well. Um, I see Melissa says, drop the subsidies, increase ad hoc payments, still expensive. Yes, uh, that's one of the reasons why the federal government increased the subsidies. They saw their ad hoc disaster assistance that they put out there for the floods of 93, the drought of 88, the drought of 83, and they figured it was cheaper to help incentivize producers to participate in their own risk management through crop insurance than it was to just provide lump sum payments when a disaster occurs. I would argue the problem Congress has had, though, is it tends to do both. It tends to support crop insurance, and then as soon as a disaster occurs, we tend to have an ad hoc disaster assistance anyway on top of that. In fact, that's one of the debates I'm watching in Congress right now. Will they do that same sort of thing here for the drought of 2012? Uh, I see Linda's typing. Dennis, how are you doing? Oh, Linda says, this was great. Thanks. I appreciate that very much. I hope this was useful for you all. Um, I guess at this point, with no other questions, I'm going to turn it back over to Melissa. Uh, 